power support for electrification uh, brought to you by the North East Automotive Alliance and uh, the industrialization centers. Um, as many of you know, the region is home to your uh, most successful electric uh, vehicle, the Nissan Leaf, your first ever gigafactory. And we've got full PMD uh, capabilities in the region. And since December 2020, over 3.85 billion of electrification investment has been announced for the region. This obviously brings fantastic news to the Northeast automotive sector and really does reaffirm the region's position as the leading location for vehicle electrification. So today's uh, event is a great opportunity for you to, uh, to get a better understanding of that. Um, if we just go on to today's agenda. Um, I'm obviously go, just going through the, the welcome now and I'll give you a little bit of insight into the, the wider automotive capabilities of the region and uh, touch on the NEA before handing over to Ryan. So uh, the North East Automotive Alliance was established in uh, March 2015. We've got over 300 member companies. So there's a delay on that slide there. Apologies. Um, we've got over 300 member companies and we actively work through a number of working groups. In terms of the Northeast automotive sector, um, there's over 200 uh, supply chain companies in the region, 31 tier ones, um, five OEMs. So we've got three of the top five off highway companies in the region. Obviously, Nissan, the largest um, automotive plant in the UK, and an extremely strong supply chain that generates over 11 billion of sales as a, as a sector for the Northeast economy. So very significant. Um, employing over 30,000 people uh, as well. So it's extremely important to the Northeast economy and to uh, the, the wider UK PLC. But today is all about electrification. Um, we're going to hand over in a, in a uh, second to Ryan Moore, who's chair of the EV North Group, and Ryan's go, going to give you some good insight into the group activities of EV North and also strengths of the automotive sector here in the northeast of England. So over to you, Ryan. Thanks, Paul, and uh, good morning, everyone. Okay, I've got control of the screen now. Slightly. Yeah, okay, here we go. Slightly laggy, but. Uh... So, EV North, uh, as Paul mentioned, is a group of the Northeast Automotive Alliance. It was established a couple of years ago uh, in order to really help focus the Alliance's activity on, uh, on electrification. Um, We've got a, a great uh, leadership group with, within EV North. Um, so if you, you look at the list of companies there, you'll see um, you know, some, some great tier one suppliers, um, obviously Nissan, AESC, and, and some fantastic smaller companies as well, um, such as Hyperdrive, um, and, and maybe some companies that you've not heard of like Curtis Instruments, who are fairly new to the, uh, to the Northeast. So it's a great group of, uh, which is, led by industry and really has deep understanding and knowledge of the electrification space and, and what's needed to drive the industry forwards. We, we formed as a group uh, really to uh, help overcome, we formed as a group to, to help overcome some of the challenges that we saw, um, basically to strengthen the Northeast position um, what we, what we were continually facing was a challenge where, um, you know, the Northeast was kind of getting overlooked by government um, in, in terms of the support or, or just the sort of voice that it had for the automotive sector. But we recognized actually compared to the rest of the country and, and actually compared to most of the rest of Europe, uh, we're in a really strong leadership position uh, to make the most of this, this huge transition from combustion engines to electric vehicle powertrain. Um, we've got absolutely fantastic regional assets here, like Paul mentioned, um, you know, in the, in the press recently, there's a lot of misreporting gone on 
but the, the first battery giga plant in Europe was the Nissan AESC plant, and it's been there for a number of years, uh, very successfully producing batteries, and, and obviously recently announced huge plans to expand that production capacity. So the first giga plant was in the northeast of England. Um, obviously, the, the Leaf uh, electric vehicle manufacturers here, but also some fantastic uh, heritage and history around R&D um, on electric vehicle components and technologies that, that actually extends back, you know, li literally right to the sort of times of the Victorians. Um, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, so the, the, the purpose of, of EV North is to bring all of that together um, and to get the, the companies in the region working together more effectively to give us a voice and help raise our profile um, to communicate out to government, to inward investors and, and even actually companies who, who are part of EV North to help them communicate within their own organizations. So oft, oftentimes these very big global corporations, you know, it, it's quite hard to go from the, the plant in the region to the, the uh, top management in the global headquarters. And, and we're, we're here to, uh, to help do that as well. And we're, we're going to help those companies and, and try and help as much as possible to make sure that the Northeast really does become a true automotive powerhouse uh, for electrification in the future. I think um, it's, it's an initiative now we can see that the whole of the, uh, the Automotive Alliance membership is behind, like Paul mentioned, you know, that the NEAA is the largest automotive cluster in the country. Um, and it's one of the largest automotive clusters in Europe. So you mustn't overlook that. There's, there's fantastic strength in numbers there. Um, so getting the whole NEAA membership behind what we're doing with EV North uh, is, is really, really important. Um, and it helps to add a lot of weight when we're talking to senior politicians and, and other companies about the region and the opportunities that we've got here. So th the mission that we've got is, is to promote the Northeast as a key global center and, and actually not just for manufacture, but also for the development of key electrification technologies. We want to raise the profile of the region, uh, both in the UK, uh, with, with the government, with international governments, and with the OEMs in the supply chain. I think it's Paul's ambition to uh, try and get at least one additional OEM to, uh, to set up a shop in the region. I'm not sure if, uh, if we'll achieve that, but certainly working hard on that. Um, some of the examples of things that we do are, are help uh, government make business case. So if you look at kind of things like the recent uh, British vaults, you know, that, that plant came about because they were looking through government for suitable sites and the Alliance was able to provide information that supported, uh, that, supported that investment case. Um, trying to get members to work together on collaborative R&D is also really important. The, the Northeast is, is way behind um, other regions in the UK in terms of accessing collaborative R&D funding. And actually, um, you know, what, what we need to do is make sure that companies in the region are getting ahead of the game. So these, these funding uh, opportunities always come out as calls and you normally have sort of six weeks to prepare an application for a call. And if, if you don't start to prepare the application until the call has come out, it's, it's actually too late. So getting ahead of, of the calls and helping to drive the agenda to make sure that the calls uh, fit the needs of the companies in the region is, is really important and something that we're actively engaging, trying to make sure happens. We've got to also ensure that we've got the skills. Um, it is a real strength in the Northeast that we've got fantastic skill base. Um, we've got you know, some great universities. We've got one of the, I think, the highest proportion of STEM students in the UK um, studying at, at our local universities um, and, and, a, and a great, heritage there really that goes right back you know you might not realize but the, the modern electrical power grid so high voltage three phase electricity distribution that was invented in the northeast uh, and if you go to the um, Newcastle University you'll find the MERS building um, so Mr. MERS created the modern power grid um, you know Parsons is a name that we might recognize modern power generation um, you know, and, and on and on. There's, there's, there is this really deep heritage, which is, is why we've got this strength in electrical power machines in the, uh, in the region. Um, we've got as well this fantastic new facility coming, which is the Driving the Electric Revolution Centre. Um, and we've got Rachel Chambers here who's going to talk about that later. So making sure we maximise the benefit from that as well is, is really, really important. Um, and another thing that, that we are quite keen on, um, is looking at opportunities to transfer technology from the automotive sector into other industries like aerospace, and in particular, Matt 
Boyle, who's who's on this uh, call, is uh, has been one of the big drivers behind that, and I think he's going to touch on that in his presentation. Um, obviously, attracting inward investment to the region is is really really important, as well as helping our own kind of homegrown startups and scale ups. Um, so, quite a wide agenda of activities there that we we are involved in. So this is uh, the fantastic infographic just helps to give you a bit of an insight. You know, th this is the northeast of England um, in a nutshell. You know, we, we've got the leaf existing leaf production here. So, you know, one of the, the most successful electric vehicles, one of the first electric vehicles in mass production, obviously recent announcements from Nissan in terms of new vehicles. So, so that is a, is a great asset to build on. We've got the first battery gigafactory. We've then got a, a, a new battery gigafactory from British Vault and additional announcements uh, from AESC. So, you know, we, we're staying ahead of the game. We'll be the only region in Europe to have two giga, giga plants for, for battery production, which is a really, really strong asset. We've got this great depth and, and breadth of experience on power electronics, machines, and drives. So you'll, you'll see that acronym used a lot, PEMD. Um, lots of electric motors already produced in the region. Lots of automotive power electronics already manufactured here. The fantastic university base that I touched on, this high proportion of students. Actually, the, the real trick for the, uh, the, our graduates is retaining them in the region. You know, we've, we've got a lot of people come here to study engineering and science subjects, but then keeping them here with, uh, with good jobs is, is the next step. And the, the huge, I mean, the, the 3.8 billion pounds of investment, I mean, that's, that's just in the last six months. It's, it, we, you couldn't go back two years ago and, and have the same sort of number. It really is a special time. You can't uh, sort of understate how huge the change is in the industry and, and how big the opportunity is that's coming to the Northeast. Uh, and that number really says it all. So, so some of the examples of inward investment uh, I touched on a little bit, the British Vault Gigafactory in Blythe, people have heard about, or in Camus, technically, Camus people get upset when you say it's in Blythe. It's on the site of the former Blythe power station on the River Blythe, but it's, it's in, uh, in Camus. Um, you've got uh, the, the huge announcements from Nissan and, and AESC about their expansion and this amazing EV360 plan from Nissan. Obviously, uh, massive investment as well in the region from Turntide, uh, acquiring Hyperdrive and, and actually my own company, Avid, which Matt's going to talk about, um, really bringing a bit of uh, Hollywood uh, pizzazz to uh, inward investment that you, you wouldn't normally have. It's normally quite a boring kind of corporate uh, grey suits job, but uh, Matt certainly transformed that for us. And, and finally, you know, mustn't forget uh, Middlesbrough and Teesside and the amazing uh, you know, materials processing industry we've got down there. So we, we'll have one of the only rare earth um, refineries in, in the world uh, once this peak resources plant is built down there. So that's making the rare earth material that's used in electric vehicle motors. So really, really important component um, and obviously will be consumed locally, but exported globally as well. So absolutely fantastic the, the first few months of this year. Let's hope we've got some more uh, pictures to add to that slide by the end of the year. So there's a very complicated uh, ecosystem in the UK and really one of the jobs of EV North is to be a bit of a conduit both in and out of the region. You know, we've got um, all these different sort of government organisations um, or, or quasi-public um, organisations that have funding or access to funding and, and are, you know, with the best interests of industry, they're trying to support industry. But I think the challenge is if you're in industry, it's quite complicated. There's lots of uh, three letter acronyms, the APCs and DERs and ATFs and KTNs, and, and it's quite easy actually to get lost. Um, so we're there to, to help that group um, talk to industry in the region, but we're also here to help industry talk to that group and try and pull together, um, pull together collaborations and get companies ahead of these funding calls um, to, to be making better use and access to the public sector support that's available. So I'll just hand over to Rachel now, um, who's going to just talk to you about the DER Industrialization Centre and, and what that's all about. Thank you, Ryan. I'm going to try and add some Hollywood pizzazz myself then. Um, so good morning, everybody. Uh, Rachel Chambers, uh, Chief Operating Officer for Drive and the Electric Revolution Centre in the North East. So as you can see from these slides, I've only got two slides, but quite important slides. Um, 
we've received £6 million worth of investment, um, and that's to spend on a scalable machine and power electronics assembly line, um, which is going to be a critical enabler um, for power electronics machines and drives growth in the UK, uh, and anchoring high value production of motors in the UK for OEMs, SMEs and, and supply chain partners. Um, this centre is an interim centre. Um, a lot of you might know that the, the main building is currently a Nightingale Hospital. Um, so uh, Sunderland Council have kindly invested in, in, in this interim building, which is, is great. Um, as you know, it's well positioned in the heart of uh, the advanced manufacturing base. And the North East really, is, as Ryan's alluded to, is a unique position to support the ambitious goals of the net zero, given its electrification capability. And, and with this centre, I'm also determined to enable that. Um, the North East is recognised internationally um, as a research centre of excellence in electrification technologies. Um, and it's a critical component of the North East England's plans to create more and better jobs. And as you can see with the amount of investment, um, there's, there's a lot of that coming through. Um, it really is a partnership approach with this centre between industry, academia and the public sector. Um, and, and having this, establishing it as a translational research facility um, with all the associated um, equipment and expertise. Um, this centre is growing capability and has the potential to really revitalise the region. Um, investment in research and development has always been quite low for this region, and, and hence why we're focused on this and then building this centre. Um, and I think as well, it will support the levelling up and the, the decarbonisation agendas to attract more of that R&D investment into the North East. Um, we'll also play a critical role in supporting manufacturing organisations um, and looking to access um, capability. Sorry, I'm just... Uh, who's flicking the slides? <laughs> That's me. I'm sorry. And I can't go backwards. So <laughs> Sorry, yeah. So we're, we're going to play a critical role in supporting manufacturing organisations and, and looking to access capability and electrification across multiple sectors. Um, we're going to help attract and retain and reinforce the world class supply chains um, for both electrical um, electric vehicle assembly and grow that supply chain in new electrification technologies and manufacturing processes. Um, we will work closely with the region's major OEMs um, and their supply chain. Um, and, and look across multiple themes, so electrification, but also adding into that, looking at industrial digitalization, um, materials to support with sustainable manufacturing, such as light weighting, um, zero emission automated logistics, which is a project that Paul's working with, and, and of course, expanding on um, the six million that we have. In addition, we also have 5G in the centre, uh, which is quite unique uh, compared to other research technology organizations in the UK. And as a result, that will really help bolster the adoption of digital technologies um, to allow companies to be more resilient and more competitive. Um, just to give you some more insights as well. So this slide here, um, as we know, there are a number of innovation and, and uh, related programs running from central government, which companies can bid into. Um, and there's a massive opportunity of which we will be supporting companies to do that. Um, you can see on the, the right hand side, the, the, the money's available, the, that's uh, meant to be in pounds there. Um, but it just shows you some of the stuff that, that is available out there for companies to access. Um, and in fact, the, the top one there, the DER challenge, it was the supply chain one has recently closed, but we had um, a lot of interest and quite a few bids submitted. And, and I see that demand increasing as the years go on. Um, so we're going to hear from Matt today as well around the investment within Turntide. And, and also Ryan talked about the investment from AESC, Nissan and British Fault. There's also several other manufacturing businesses that have indicated they want to come to the region. And, and I think if you look at the infrastructure that we've got, you know, it speaks for itself. Um, the ability for us, it's really important to attract these businesses and having this infrastructure um, is, is going to be really critical as, as well as having a destination for training. Um, so, you know, it's, it's no um, secret that training and skills is it's a huge challenge um, within engineering, but having a centre like this to enable um, people to do that kind of training um, in kind of a real life um, 
centre is going to be really helpful. And it's going to be extremely important to the large OEMs in the region and the supply chain to help them with that shift and that transition um, into electrification. So we have a centre, we've got um, the ability to do the training and actually having the R&D and the collaborative um, support there is really, really essential for attracting foreign inward investment. So that's me done. I will hand over, or Ryan will. <laughs> thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Ryan. Um, I'm sure many people have got questions. Um, so if I could just ask you to pose them in the uh, chat function, we'll pick them up during the panel session later on. Um, I think it's clear to see that we've got a great um, base from which to grow here in the Northeast. And there's an awful lot of support out there um, from the UK government uh, in terms of developing electrification capabilities. Um, I know we've got Julian Heatherington, who's due to uh, join the panel session later, director of the Automotive Transformation Fund, which is the, the one billion pots uh, that was announced by the, the government uh, some time ago. Um, as Ryan alluded to, we've got a strong electrification heritage here in the Northeast, but Nissan have played a, quite a, a key major part in developing that uh, the, the current capabilities that exist here through their investment and their foresight to invest in the LEAF and the, the battery facility back in uh, 2010 with production starting around 2013. The recent announcement from Nissan, Envision and Sunderland uh, Council means they will continue to be at the forefront of our electrification capability. And I'm delighted today that we're joined by Alan Johnson, who's Vice President and Managing Director of Nissan Motor Manufacturing UK, to give us more insight into EV360. Over to you, Alan. Hi, Paul, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, Laura, if you don't mind doing the business with the, the slides, please, we'll try and keep it simple. Um, so I'll try and introduce to everybody the EV360 uh, project. Next slide, please, Laura. So um, effectively, the graphic on the right-hand side is, is enhanced by the, the text on the left. So I'll just go through it one step at a time. The, the EV360 announcement made two weeks ago, obviously a big, big announcement for us and a significant in many ways. One example is that it's the first time that Nissan, at least in the history of the Sunderland plant, so going back 35 years, the first time that Nissan has announced a global strategy and deployed that global strategy um, in outside of Japan, actually. So obviously in our case in the UK, so a great honour and, and quite an achievement for, for the plant, I think, to, to, to secure this um, project. So the project in itself, um, I think the best bit about it is the way it's all joined up together and all fits together really nicely. Um, first of all, at the top there, you've got the all new electric vehicle, which will be produced by us here in Sunderland. Um, that will combine our EV know-how from LEAF with our um, crossover expertise from successful products such as Duke and uh, Qashqai. So we're excited about that, uh, you know, and that in itself is a big, big announcement for, for us here in the Sunderland plant, a car plant that doesn't have any new models, doesn't have much of a future as you can imagine. So this is great news for us and gives us security moving forward. Um, the next element of the plan is the Envision AAC Gigafactory. So as has been mentioned already, um, Envision AAC have a Gigafactory next door to, to us here um, at the Sunland plant. And uh, there's been an excellent announcement from AAC to invest uh, in the region of 450 million uh, for a new Gigafactory, um, which um, clearly strategically it is excellent for, for the Nissan plant and excellent for the region. Um, and then all that's pulled together with this um, microgrid project, which um, is going to give us by 2025, 100% renewable energy, um, not only for 
Nissan and Sunderland, but also for ASC and for anyone else who chooses to um, come and be based within the IAMP um, International Advanced Manufacturing um, Park here, just adjacent to the plant. Um, so some of the numbers that, that are, were flashing around, which I think are pretty impressive. So £423 million investment from Nissan. Um, we expect that we'll be producing 100,000 vehicles per year of this new electric vehicle. Um, 909 jobs within Nissan. 450 million from ASC, 750 jobs. And importantly, uh, the opportunity to expand further in the future. And the, the, the 80 million from uh, Sunderland City Council, fantastic project, first of its kind. Um, and that will also include um, an interesting project for us, which is reuse of or giving a second life to uh, leaf batteries. So once the vehicle's finished its life, we want to use the batteries to store energy that are, uh, that's generated um, renewably um, by ourselves or by our partners in the area. Um, next slide, please, Laura. So just to bring out some of the, the kind of keynotes, the EV360 is a key milestone for us. I really do believe that this is a monumental announcement. Um, it, it sets the direction for us very clearly uh, in terms of carbon neutrality and electrification of our vehicles. Um, and strategically, it, it puts us in a wonderful position now um, to, to help us secure um, further vehicle allocations in the future aligned with this strategy. So really, really significant announcement uh, from our point of view. Strategically, of course, vital for in terms of investment, £1 billion pound combined investment for this uh, region. I do believe it's just the start. You, you, you'll have seen last week an announcement in the UK um, around electrification, um, and there may well be more to come. Um, and obviously, uh, the more that we can get in the Northeast, uh, the better. Um, 6,000 jobs, including the supply chain, is obviously a massive boost. A lot of these jobs are in the Northeast. And you know, I think this is the start. I think for all sorts of reasons, we, we will be encouraging and hoping to see the supplier base um, locate closer to, to us. Clearly good from a carbon neutrality point of view. Uh, I think it will be good from a, a, a regional um, value content point of view, which is important for um, Brexit and all that stuff. Um, so it can only be good, uh, I think, for the for the whole of the Northeast, and, and I'm, I'll be interested to see how interest picks up in terms of utilisation of the IAM and the other um, manufacturing locations that are around this area. Next slide, please. So just to, to show you kind of um, geographically what I'm talking about, um, the, the uh, wind turbines you can probably see around about the, just to the left of centre of the, 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 the image is at the south of the Nissan Sunderland plant. And then as you move from left to right, in effect, you're going south to north. Um, but within the plant, we have plans for further solar panel um, projects, more wind turbines, um, the microgrid encompasses all the um, IAMP space, which is towards the top of the image, including the space allocated for Envision AESC, and included within this is a new substation as well. So it really is a joined up approach, um, and, and I think it's a wonderful asset now for the whole of the region. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, Alan. Um, I think it's testament to the, the team at Nissan and the, the capability that exists there um, that you've been so successful in uh, in winning this uh, this investment and the, the fact the strategy was announced uh, for the first time outside of Japan. And I think that last slide really does give uh, a, a great indication of the scale uh, of the investment as well. So um, I know Chris Cagle, MD for Envision AESC, will be joining the panel session later. So if there's anyone got any questions 
uh, related to batteries, then obviously Chris is there to, to answer that as well. So many of you know um, Professor Matt Boyle, OBE. Um, Matt has been a leading figure in electrification for some time, having built Sevcon um, in, into a, a significant business and then sold it to, to Borg Warner back in 2017. Uh, then Matt went on to play a key role in establishing driving the electric revolution program and he's chair both of the NEAA and the driving the electrification uh, uh, industrialization center. Um, Matt recently led Turntide Transport acquisition of the three Northeast businesses, uh, Avid, um, Hyperdrive and Borg Warner. And I'm delighted that Matt's here to explain more. Over to you, Matt. Can somebody explain it to me then, Paul? <laughs> so, so, so somebody, I can't remember if it was Ryan or, or uh, Rachel who mentioned Hollywood Razmataz. Uh, I'll come on to that in a minute, um, no doubt. But, but one of the things uh, when Paul asked me to come along here and talk about the acquisition of technology is, I, is, is I, I, you know, I had to go back to kind of where I was personally two years ago, um, getting really, really frustrated um, working for Her Majesty's government looking at an, an amazing opportunity in electrification, both in the Northeast and globally, and ask myself the question, how the devil can we play? And it, it quickly became obvious that the, the best way to play was to amalgamate some of the businesses, some of the capability across, my original thought was across um, the Northeast. It then expanded because of um, all sorts of situations to acquisitions across the UK, um, but then it retrenched to the Northeast, mainly as a consequence of kind of refocusing on where capability actually exists. So I want to talk to you uh, this morning, I'll, I'll briefly introduce Tante, but I also want to talk to you a little bit about um, why it's important, why it was important to do it in the Northeast. So Turntide Industries, um, for those of you who don't know Turntide, and I, I imagine it's most of the people on this call, uh, the, the business actually started um, less than a decade ago in um, Northern California, looking at um, building built environment. So the main focus of the business was to uh, support um, improvements in technology in things like HVAC, um, refrigeration, that sort of thing. Um, and it was focused mainly on a, a kind of esoteric for most people, motor technology called switch reluctance. Um, and the only thing you need to know about switch reluctance is it, it, it's a very cheap motor to make, but an extremely difficult motor to control. So it actually played into the hands of the capability in the Northeast. So we have some very, very bright um, drives people um, and the motor itself is, is fairly straightforward. And indeed, the, the motor technology is controlled by, or was controlled by uh, Sevcon um, three or four years ago now, and is still in manufacturing. That, that inverter is still in manufacturing today. So that's where it comes from. It comes from, from buildings management, buildings, uh, cooling and heating. And the motor technology, however, um, and I won't bore you with the history, but the motor technology, however, is also applicable in transport. And the, the relationship I had with the founder of Turntide is that he was at one point the chairman of Sevcon. So back in the day, Ryan Morris, who is chair of Turntide, um, was also chair of Sevcon. But uh, and, and I'll, I'll come on to how the relationship built up, but fundamentally the focus of Turntide Transport in the UK is to focus on the long tail of electrification. So um, we're not going to get into designing um, machines and inverters for high volume car manufacturers, but we are going to get involved and we are involved in things like trucking and buses, rail, marine, and as Paul mentioned earlier on, aerospace. And it is about, um, it's, for us, it's, it's not only about um, uh, electrification of, of transport, it's also electrification full stop. And that, that really leads me on to, to why we did this. And 
there were I can tell you there were many conversations um, eight hours apart because Ryan's on the west coast of the United States and I'm obviously here about what the actual challenge is. And the challenge is that greenhouse gas emissions have got to drop by something like 32 gigatons of CO2 equivalent per annum to meet the Paris, the Paris Accord. It, when, you, when you understand that that is something like 45% of our, of our total emissions, you can see how that fits in with what do, we do, what do we do about the big issues of, tra of transport, the big issues of agriculture, the big issues of buildings? So turn tide, we're all already addressing some of the building stuff, but we brought with us um, the capability in putting the businesses together in the Northeast, the ability to, to um, tackle the transport um, problem, which is about 24% of our CO2 emissions globally. And the thing, of course, is that, that transport can't stop, um, but it has to be sustainable. And uh, it can be sustainable. It's not, not going to do it overnight, but it can be sustainable. And then, as I said, the adjacent sectors that we're, we've been looking at and we will continue to focus on for the future are things like energy, agriculture and construction. So having said that is the problem, um, we went about trying to work out um, what, what's needed to address a difficult problem like this. Well, there's really two things. You need capability and you need resources. And the capability talks about the people. And, uh, you know, as Paul's already said, and Ryan echoed and, and Rachel added um, and Alan added, the talent in this region is almost second to none. And... Uh, I will, I, will, I will cover the talent, the resources, and the very important point at the very end, which is something that Alan brought up, and that is it cannot cost the planet. You have to look at recycling. You have to look at recovery of some of this stuff in order for it to be truly sustainable. So let's talk about the talent. It is no accident that the United Kingdom is one of the three places in the world where you would consider doing power electronics machines and drives. And that's because since the end of the Second World War, it's been one of the leading generators of, of intellectual property and product development uh, in power electronics machines and drives across the UK. If you look at the Northeast, you would see that going back to Ryan's um, disclosure and stealing my thunder earlier on, um, that this region has been at the forefront of electric vehicle technology since the 1960s. And it's for those reasons that the capability exists, both in the UK, but also more acutely in the Northeast. And that is one of the reasons why Turntide looked at investing in both the UK, first of all, but, but more latterly, uh, the Northeast. There are two other places of, of note um, described on this slide, and that is the, the north of Italy, um, and that again is an accident of history, and the northeast of the United States. Um, you, you wouldn't be at all surprised to hear that places like MIT, um, Northeastern, are, are at the forefront of some of this stuff, especially in drive technology and power electronics. Investable resources. What do I mean by investable resources? I mean money. It's hard cash. It's, it's difficult to do anything in this sphere just with one or the other. Capability, no money. We end up being or facing this, as the, as, uh, the economists like to call it, the, the valley of death. Lots of good ideas, but no ability to execute. Raising money in the UK is almost impossible for this stuff because it's risky. Now, I won't, I won't dwell on that. So if you move on then, you say, where, where, is this, where is this money going to come from? And it was dead easy. Well, relatively. Um, you go to the US, you go to the West Coast of the US, and US philanthropy is incredible. 
both in its breadth and its depth and its very deep pockets. So Tongue Tied is actually a 10 year old company, but it's, it's really been operating at the forefront of this stuff for about the last four or five years. And it was recognized by uh, Bill Gates as one of the places that his climate a hedge fund would invest money in for the technology. But Robert Downey Jr. and Jeff Bezos also gave it money for the ability to expand. Now, when they were investing in this company, it was a group of about 60 people and it was headquartered and did all its work in California. It's now got a footprint, quite literally, that spans the globe. And it did that because of its, its availability of, of um, hard cash and money. And that, that commitment continues. So our intent, Turn Tide's intent, we, can, we will continue to invest in the Northeast. Why? Because that's where the capability is. Our future, in plans, our future plans include investments in things like education, because the pipeline of talent for these, these sectors needs to, needs to be expanded. Um, and the best place to do it is the pipeline of youth coming through our schools and, and through our universities and colleges. We are going to continue to invest in R&D because that's the future lifeblood of the, of the business. Unusually, yes, you've seen it. You're the first people to see this. Um, manufacturing. We are going to invest in manufacturing. And last, but by no means least, I did mention that it cannot cost the planet. So one of the things that we will be doing um, is, is looking at the recycling of all this stuff and the reuse of it at the end of its first and second natural lives. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Matt. Um, much appreciated. And thank you to all the other presenters as well today. Um, I think the, given the pace uh, of change within the automotive sector um, as we move towards electrification, um, there are in, uh, obviously increasing opportunities for companies to, um, to join the sector. Um, and undoubtedly, now is the best time there's ever been for companies who have the, the right capabilities to look at moving in um, into the automotive industry. But as, as everyone's pointed out today, it's not just about automotive electrification. There, there's lots of opportunities in, in other sectors too. So um, we're, we're now going to move over to the panel um, discussion. Um, we've got a number of questions that have come in, um, some of which have been partly been answered uh, today during the presentations, but I'm, I'm going to go through through them and then just raise them. So um, just one, I wanted to pick up on here and just get the panel's thoughts on this. Um, the government obviously announced that internal combustion engines will be banned uh, in new vehicles by uh, 2030 for petrol and uh, diesel and also uh, hybrid by 2035. Do you see the market moving sooner? And if so, uh, when? <clears throat> you want Anyone? me to go with that one? Please, Alan. Obviously, I'm speaking from this one. Um, we, we do see the market going sooner. Um, we see that hybrids are transitional uh, and the vision that Nissan has is very clearly for Europe, a, a lineup which is completely EV. So, you know, at some point in time, um, I think the internal combustion engine will, will no longer be needed for the European market. Um, I, I wouldn't be drawing in exactly what we think is going to happen and when, but we are, we are probably expecting things to happen ahead of uh, the UK government's targets. And that's how we are positioning ourselves, starting with this um, new announcement this week, uh, over the last couple of weeks. Um, so yeah, we, we definitely think that uh, we're going to be moving earlier to completely EV for passenger cars. Um, but ultimately, you know, governments will, will incentivise it encourage it or discourage it depending on what they want to do but finally the customers will decide and, and the real challenge for us 
when we're going to much higher volumes of, of EV production um, is to make sure that these vehicles are competitively priced and also financially viable. So that, that's a big challenge we have. Thank you, Alan. Anyone I, I, want? I was going to say, I'd just like to chip in on that. Julian Hetherington from the Advanced Propulsion Centre. I think, you know, our research indicates that, you know, we're going to see the shift probably for a, a, a number of reasons in the UK and in uh, wider Europe, actually. And, th and those reasons are, are, are many factorial. Firstly, you've got coordinated policy action by governments, which includes things like the plug-in vehicle grants extension, uh, you look at the investment that's going into the infrastructure for charging, for public charging infrastructure, where Department for Transport you know, managed to win a significant slug of money in last year's spending review to support that. You know, and as an EV user, I can tell you that, that that's um, that's going to be beneficial. Um, but also, we're seeing uh, you know a, a real shift in consumer propensity to consider buying an EV, and that's resulted, you know, uh, in in getting to almost a critical mass of electrified vehicles out on the road now when people drive them um actually they're pretty good uh, and you don't want to go back to a conventional powered vehicle so i think um consumer pressure will probably run ahead of regulation uh, for many of those reasons uh, and where where really we've got to try and make a difference is improving the affordability of vehicles uh, at an entry level and for those people that aren't necessarily in, in the market for a 35,000 pound plus car uh, and that's where the work to try and deliver you know some of the experience curve advantages the you know the scale advantages uh, you know, to try and reduce the uh, the input costs particularly for batteries uh, that will start to improve accessibility and then it will take off and we'll wonder what all the fuss was about. Thank you, Julian. Any other comments from the panel? If, if not, just a, a related question to that then. Given the um, uh, it, its forecast to be an accelerated move to electrification, where do you see the main challenges around electrification supply chain being? And where do you think the best opportunities are uh, for companies within the electrification supply chain? Can I jump in on this one, Paul? Yep. It's uh, Ryan here. Um, I think at the moment, um, it's quite interesting, you know, it, in the in the news, uh, just the other day, you, you've got um, semiconductor shortages. Um, you've also got uh, issues in terms of battery capacity. So there's, there's kind of a, a lot of supply chain challenges at the moment, um, <laughs> literally ranging from bits of wood to uh, semiconductors. But I, th I think in particular, if we look at what's happening in the world around us, you know, we're going to a more, you know, energy efficient world with variable speed drives and higher performing motors and, and components um, and more and more energy storage and, and battery systems. So the key fundamental technologies that enable those three things um, are, are in demand. So, um, you know, semiconductor switching devices uh, and, and microprocessors are, are a big challenge. Um, and there's global shortages of conventional devices and newer compound semiconductor devices. And that is, that's, a, that's quite a long-term problem to fix because of the time it takes to build new plants and, and the investment, the scale of investment required is, is billions and billions. Um, electrical machines, um, we mentioned about rare earth um, component uh, earlier and the investment from peak resources by, you know, by nature, by definition, rare earths are rare. Are rare. Um, Turntides technology um, doesn't have rare earth magnets in it, um, and you know there there are some solutions like that. But uh, th you know things around electric motor supply chain and and particularly to do with high performance motors again are are in demand. Um, and then finally, any, anything to do with the battery system, so up and down the battery value chain, um, you know look at everything from looking at new sources for uh, sustainable sources for lithium to removing some of the um, the more contentious materials out of uh, out of battery systems, um, uh, right up to quite simple things like uh, pressed copper bus bars for uh, for battery packs, and the best method to join them well, you know, do you wire bond or weld the, the bus bars onto the cells? So there's there's a lot of work in in and amongst the battery pack as well, and and part, partly because it's the highest cost element, so there's always going to be 
uh, a lot of focus on the battery system to try and drive cost out. But um, it's, it's my answer is sort of everything, but you know, which is, is maybe not a surprise, but those particularly those three kind of key areas around uh, power electronics components, machines components, and the battery systems um, up, up and down the value chain. Thank you, Ryan. Julian, did you want to come in there? I did, yeah. I think, um, you know, we've got a focus with the Automated Transformation Fund in four key technology quadrants. And those are the four key technology quadrants that we think the UK stands a good chance, uh, you know, of delivering. Uh, and those are batteries, electric motors, um, power electronics and fuel cells. And, and then there's a fifth supporting one, which is around the closed materials economy and recycling. I think if you look at uh, if you look at where a lot of the cost is, it's in upstream materials. Uh, and we have an opportunity here as we start to establish, you know, at scale, these industries in the UK to engineer very cost effective, resilient supply chains from the ground up. We're not trying to alter something that already exists. We've not got any invested assets, um, you know, that, that, are, that are legacy and difficult to convert. We have an opportunity to do this from the ground up. And that's a great strength. I think the biggest opportunities for us in the UK, uh, particularly when, when we're looking at the higher values, is the the blend, and this is a real advantage for the Northeast as well, actually, specifically, it's the blend of the chemical sector uh, along with our technology sector in automotive. You look at many of the inputs that go into batteries in particular, around 80% of the value of finished cell is input materials, and they are largely the products of the chemical sector. And what do you need to make the chemical sector efficient? You need access to ports for raw materials. Uh, you need access to power that is low carbon intensity and at good value. More of that later. Uh, and you also need a bit of an ecosystem because in the chemical sector, you know, one man's uh, waste product is another person's feedstock. OK, and that's how you design these, these systems to be efficient. So we've got a great opportunity in the upstream materials, particularly when life cycle assessment and we target net zero and not just zero emissions at tailpipe. Because then the embedded carbon and all of the wider environmental impacts of extracting and processing these materials uh, really starts to be costed and valued and the UK's opportunity starts to come to the fore. So where we can deliver really cost effective power through systems like the microgrid that's been uh, pursued to support Envision and Nissan. You know, we first had discussions about that a year and a half ago, and that concept has now flourished and it's helping to unlock some greater efficiency in the supply chain. Combine that, combine that with you know, all of the opportunities in the chemical sector and we're on a winning formula. Things like anode materials, graphitization, where we've already got lots of the base feedstock in the UK coming from our own petrochemicals industry, companies like Philips 66 up in the Northeast, supplying a lot of needle coke into, into China, which is then graphitized and then comes back in anode material. We can do that in the UK and cut out an awful lot of carbon emissions in the process. So it gives us the ability to, to press on, on those points and, and also leverage the very strong technical capability that we've got you know, in our universities uh, and research and technology organisations in the UK, in those four technology quadrants. Thank you, Julian. I'm just conscious, uh, Chris, that, and uh, Chris Cagle, I know you've got to drop off in a, in a short while, but um, I just wondered if you could comment on the uh, on the supply chain for yeah. batteries and, and where the UK is well positioned and, and where you see key opportunities. Yeah, sure, Paul. I, to I totally agree with everything that um, Julian's just said about the, the Northeast having a unique opportunity because of its uh, its chemical sector heritage. I think for us, we've always seen this as likely to be a, a bit of a domino effect um, for the supply chain to really um, be able to kick in with investments in the UK. I think the first was the confirmation by the OEMs that they're going to produce EVs in the country. And I think that largely took Brexit and understanding what that deal and that economic environment looked like to, to be able to allow those confirmations to happen. And as Alan's explained and everyone's aware, I guess the, you know, the Nissan recent announcement was the first confirmation of that, which is, is fantastic news. And then it needed the second step, which actually 
happened at exactly the same time, which was a battery manufacturer to confirm that it's got a solid investment in the UK um, and can give clear demand signal to the supply chain. So now that battery manufacturing is confirmed in the country and in the region, I think that allows the conversations with potential suppliers to move on to kind of the next level. I think up to now, the conversations we've been having is, you know, along the lines of, yes, there's capability, yes, there's interest, um, and yes, there'd be an outline plan there, but really for suppliers to, to really develop an accurate and fully costed business case for investment, it's needed a clear, um, right, what's the specification of the material that you need? What's the quantity that you're going to commit to through a contract? And now that we're in a position to confirm those numbers, the conversations with the supply chain are certainly accelerating. Um, so I think we're, we're now at the point where the supply chain is ready to, to, to kind of move on to the next step in terms of those detailed uh, evaluations and hopefully ready to, to, to start making some confirmed investments. Thank you, Chris. Um, right, just uh, want to bring bring the discussion back to skills. Um, there's a number of uh, questions come through uh, around the skills agenda. So, um, Matt, you've already touched on the on the skills and the attractiveness, but um, uh, how important is the skill base in helping companies adapt to to changing technologies and to attracting in, uh, investment in the region? And the follow-on question linked to that is then how we look to um, to raise awareness of the, the opportunities around the electrification within schools to make sure we've got the, the talent pipeline coming through or in, infused in, in those areas? Thanks, Paul. Yeah, so so taking the second part of the question first, I think, you, you know, as, as you know, I've been involved in skills for a wee while, um, and the biggest issue has always been um, painting a picture for somebody who you know, who's quite young, hasn't really formulated what they want to do in life, um, paint a picture for them of what the future might hold. And one of the, th one of the sea changes I've seen in the last couple of years is that uh, youngsters, uh, key stage um, five, key stage six, uh, have no intention of buying an internal combustion engine. They've got no intention of being, of being hooked on materialism the way, the way certainly my generation was. And I think that's a huge sigh of relief for people like me because making that transition and, and painting that picture for them is actually a whole lot easier. So uh, I've, I'm, I'm hugely uh, optimistic about our ability to, to funnel people into um, engineering and STEM in particular, you know, STEM in particular and, and, and engineering in particular um, over the next decade or so. But, but that kind of talks to the, sec the first part of your question. The first part of your question, I think, is role models demonstrating the art of possible and creating a, an ecosystem that supports um, people into STEM, into engineering, and, and into manufacturing is something that is still a responsibility. And I don't think we do enough. And uh, part of it is that, that we are ourselves running very, very hard to stand still. Um, but also, I, I think there is an opportunity, certainly with, with um, people like the Turntay Group, but also looking at the universities, the, the IOTs, the further education establishments and, and kind of the apprenticeship framework, there is now, there is now a, a, build, a set of building blocks that I think if, if properly um, uh, deployed, could do as a great favor in both retraining, upskilling, and creating the sorts of people we need for manufacturing and everything, as Chris has said, from chemical engineering all the way through to recycling and sustainability. Um, and so I'm hugely optimistic about uh, being able to do that for the region. It, you know, one of the reasons that that Turntide came here was the capability we could demonstrate. That hasn't changed. And in fact, if we build on that, I think more people will come. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Ryan, I'm just going to ask you to come in on this point as well, just linking back to the infographic and the um, the, the point around the, uh, uh, the graduate base we have in this region and how important it is around uh, retaining those as opposed to exporting them. 
Yeah, it's 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 a it's a slight twist, I guess. That we've we've got these fantastic um, institutions in the northeast, the high, higher education and and, and further education, um, some great universities, which have, have all got um, some really strong specialisms in in power electronics, machines, and drives, which do literally go back to the sort of eighteen. 80s, 1890s, you know, you, you just look at the names on the buildings and um, it tells a fantastic story in, in itself. So we've got um, the highest proportion of STEM students in, um, in the country coming to our universities, which is great. Um, but a, a lot of them come from outside of the region to, um, to study here, which so that is, is an opportunity in itself in encouraging more kids in the region um, to, to go and study or get work in, in STEM subjects. Um, and we've been doing some work with the LEP to, to try and uh, encourage that. Obviously, it's been very, very difficult to go out and actually get in amongst schools um, in, in the last year or so. But uh, we produced a great video with the support of, of all the members um, to try and um, basically sh show the opportunity. And in, in a lot of ways, actually, I think the video we made is was probably more impactful um, than, than actually physically going out because we got some great footage inside uh, the different plants and design centers and things to show the op opportunity. So getting more kids in the region to, to go into STEM is, is a big opportunity. But then uh, retaining the students that come to study here. So the, the, the twist is we've got the highest proportion of STEM, but then actually one of the lowest graduate retention rates in the country. So people who come to study in the Northeast, unfortunately, a lot of them um, leave and, and go and get uh, in, into employment elsewhere. So uh, just just tweaking that a little bit would really help um, in terms of creating more professional jobs up here. And it was, it was certainly, you know, my, my experience of running a, an R&D business um, in the region, it was always a great asset to be able to work with the local unis and recruit, uh, and recruit staff. And things like the DER Centre should just continue to build on that and make that even better in the future. Yeah, thank you. So, um, go on, Rachel. Yeah, ju Last just topic. to add. Yeah, just to add to that. I mean, the whole purpose of of the centre, the DER centre, is to 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 support a coordinated approach. Um, I think there's recognition regionally across all the colleges and universities that they can provide pretty much everything that's needed um, to support a growth in this area. Um, and having a centre that allows practical training it is what we're here for. Um, I think as well, it's quite fragmented. Um, I don't think that's a Northeast issue. I think that's across the country around a career um, or a training course in this area. It's, it's you know, it needs to be demystified. Um, and again, that's the purpose of what we're trying to do by working with all the um, industry partners and universities. Um, I think there is recognition with industry that they need to invest. It has to be a dual approach, um, but equally there's government support. Um, so I know that the DER Challenge um, are going to be putting an open call out soon um, for about six million to support the skills. Um, APC get heavily involved, Auto Council. So there is a lot of work going on. I think regionally, um, uh, Ryan alluded to, I mean, Ryan and I did a lovely video recently, um, which is going to go into the local um, colleges to try and encourage, you know, young students to get a career in in electrification and that that work will, will continue and we will you know bang the drum around skills and you know, getting a diverse mix of students uh, of across all ages um you know to, to want to study in, in engineering thank you rachel so well, um well, yeah, sorry, Alan. if you don't mind i just if i could be cheeky and just get a plug in here um the nissan skills foundation is something that I think we are guilty of underselling massively in the, in the last five or six years since it was set up. Um, it really is a fantastic operation. We bring in school children from the all over the Northeast, get them engaged with the concepts of manufacturing, production, and engineering. Um, we really do try and focus on on girls, and getting them engaged, um, and it's. It's wonderful to see, actually, and actually recently, over the last two or three weeks, I've had the opportunity to showcase it to our COO, um, Ashwani Gupta, to the chairman of Nissan Europe, and also our prime minister. 
and and you, you you know they're used to seeing factories and they're used to seeing machines and all that stuff. But when these they see the engagement and the excitement that the children uh, demonstrate genuinely with the activities that are taking part in, um, the feedback I got from our CEO is one of the best things he's ever seen in a car plant. So you know we need to push it harder. Um, we've started doing that recently in the media. Um, but anybody who's tuning in, if you've got children, um, please, and you're in the Northeast, um, get in touch and we'll be happy to, to get all the schools in the Northeast through the Skills Foundation. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Yeah, and I, I, I do know it, it's an absolutely fantastic programme that engages uh, tens of thousands of uh, school children a year. Um, and, and I think there's opportunities there for us as a network to to actually link in and, and capitalise on that and, and get more companies doing uh, similar programmes so we can really broaden that uh, that STEM engagement. Um, and conscious uh, of people's time, I know um, we're, we're planning a breakout session now for uh, for networking, but just in terms of clo closing comments, um, we, we do have a fantastic opportunity here and we, we get that investment that we, we've seen coming through uh, recently, 3.85 billion since De December announced for the Northeast, which is fantastic. We do envisage there'll be a knock-on effect and further investment will come into the region. That undoubtedly will help in terms of helping to attract uh, more students, but also retain. And then this becomes a virtuous circle. This is what clustering is all about. And we, I, I could envisage a, a the, the northeast around electrification having a, a, a similar effect to something like Silicon Valley, where you've really got that concentration of companies, of skills, of talent uh, building up in this in this region. And one of the advantages of the of the northeast region is that we are a small geographic region. We are a friendly region. There's an awful lot of collaboration takes place here um, within the Northeast and uh, across the broader UK ecosystem as well. So I'd encourage anybody who's who's keen to, to, to be involved in um, electrification, anybody uh, who wants more in, information about how they could tap into the network to understand where they could get support because there's an awful lot of companies out there to reach out. We we will we do talk to each other on a on a regular basis, all the the key organisations, and we will help companies navigate that uh, that myriad of uh, of support that's out there to make sure you get the best uh, for your business. So I'd just like to thank all our speakers today: Alan uh, Alan Johnson, Chris Cagill, uh, Ryan, Rachel, Julian, uh, and Matt for today, and thank you all for attending. And now I think we're going to hand over to, uh, to various breakout rooms for, for some general networking. Thanks all.